To design the world's first truly private helicopter, it takes a hard-working and brilliant team of engineers with an incredible leader. But to create a brand that people are proud of and love requires a community. And Hill has just that. The dedication and hard work of our engineers would be futile without the incredible community that surrounds Hill. You are the community. Good morning, my name is Rebecca Searle. Peter Wilson. Scott Gibson. Stuart Adams. Lou Bagley. Kate Cook. Kathy and Dale Buchanan. Tony Johnson. Pat Hartsman. Steve Brooks. Buddy Steve Bucket. Mark Falknell. Chris Knuppers. I'm Charlie from Oxford in the UK and I am serial number 53. I'm serial number 59. Apex 50 serial number 34 and HC 50 serial number 007. Serial number 71. Serial numbers 10 and 36. I am number 59. Number 38 for the HX 50. Serial number 28. Serial number 51. I uh, am serial number 9. The serial number that I selected is 50. Serial number 26 for the new HX50. I'm serial number 21. We are absolutely delighted to be a part of this amazing journey with all of you. And I'm really looking forward to this engineering journey with Hill Helicopters over the next couple of years. I'm chassis number 42 and delighted to be part of this incredible voyage of exploration. To everybody that's here, it's amazing to have people from, Ruben, 21 different countries this evening. 21 different countries, and welcome, everyone. Thank you for being with us. <laughs> you know, there's so many special people here tonight, and it's going to be impossible to mention all of them. But to start with, you know, there's a, a club, a group, that started a long time ago. That's right. It all started in August 2020. Yeah. And time flies. Not only our machines, but time does fly. It does. It's incredible. It has been two years. What happened those two years? Two years. You know, we had this idea, this vision back then that we would have a club, a 100 club, that would be sort of what you would call early adopters, people that saw the vision early and wanted to get in on what Jason was creating, this, this incredible dream that he was creating. Absolutely. There's a special word for those. Thank you very much. We got applause. The first really supporters, the first 100. Thank you. But then the journey didn't end there. No. What happened after? We had so many more people from all over the world, 46 countries actually, that have joined this amazing group. And it's really a worldwide group. It's dynamic, it's exciting, and we're all joined by the same vision, the same dream of flying this helicopter someday. Absolutely. I dream about it every single day. Who doesn't? Right? We're Perfect. looking forward to that. That's why we're here. And it has been an incredible journey. J Jason's going to share about how many are we right now. But it's growing every single day. And I want to give a special thanks. I, probably he's here. I haven't seen it. The latest client, Diogenes, from Brazil just last night or about one or two days ago. Thank you. So yes. to all of you, thank you very much for supporting Hill from the beginning in different parts of the journey. Thank you again. Absolutely. We're going to give you just a little bit of an idea of what tonight's going to look like. Um, we have lots of amazing things in store for you. I think you're going to really enjoy it. Uh, we're going to start with a presentation from Jason. It's going to be about 50 minutes or so. Then what's going to happen? After that, as usual, we have this just the way of being kill is that all questions are welcome. Yes. And we'd like to make it very clear that we want questions from the audience here. And also, by the way, we're not only this group. Who's no. also with us today? We have an amazing group of people that weren't able to make it, either owners or people that are following this amazing journey, and they're watching online right now. So we just want to say a big welcome to you guys as well. Thank you for being here um, online. I know some people really tried to make it, and there was last minute things that they couldn't come. And so, uh, so we're actually really happy to be able to see you as well joining from there. And so, yeah, we're going to be able to have questions from online and questions from the audience. And so that's going to be happening after the presentation for about 45 minutes. And after that, after we're going to have a lot of networking opportunity, get together again. There's going to be, I think, very good food. Just had a little pieces here and there. But after we have the uh, session, we're going to have an opportunity to continue our mingling together and just uh, being a really a worldwide community with some foods and drinks. So thank you again. What are you bringing now, there? Now, Ruben, there's something back here that uh, okay. I think we wanted to show some people. A suitcase. 
What's in here? A suitcase. Okay, what is in there? Yeah, I don't know. Let's have a look. Okay. There, there might be something exciting in here. You know, this is an amazing club, amazing group of people that have been very eager and asking for All some right. special things. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. You've asked so for what it. What do we have here? So a lot of people ask, can we get some Hill merch? <laughs> can we Hill get something that we can be proud of as showing off? So uh, we work on this quite a bit. And Why did this take so long, Ruben? This, this took a very uh, long time you know, to get some simple clothing, right? If uh, people think that supply chain in the aviation is complicated, textile, much worse. <laughs> it's very complicated. But anyhow, uh, I think it's uh, harder to make a jacket than making a helicopter nowadays. But when you look at the details, yes. We have the story of Hill on the Absolutely. inside here. Absolutely. There's a lot of details here and uh, a good logo back. So if you want to take home a piece Ooh. to wear, not today. It's a little hot right for warm. that jacket right now, we'll but you're going to enjoy that fast. very soon, actually. But there's some really good merch here. Especially and when you get back to Canada, right? So that's available around the corner yes. there when you get out. And uh, if you want to really wear Hill, opportunities start there as well. We're going to have a website for that as well, because maybe many of you have already asked from all over the world. Now. Misha, what else do you want to share before we get to the really important stuff? Anything I think, else? I think we're ready to have Jason come on stage. So go ahead. You guys, put your hands together for Dr. Jason Hill. We want welcome to welcome Jason. him to the stage. Thank you, Jason, for being here this evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Hill Helicopters. So uh, this evening, I've got the, the usual uh, get up for you. We've got a, a presentation. I'm going to take a, a moment to just explain what we've been up to over the last few months. I'll show you some of the things that we've been building, and we're going to talk about where we go to next. So the shape of the presentation this evening is I want to start by talking about this incredible journey that we're all on. The journey to develop uh, and enjoy HX50 started a long time before you guys joined us. And the journey will last a lot longer than the day that you receive uh, your helicopter in the massive community that we've built all over the world. I'll talk a little bit about a unique approach to developing the helicopter, both from a design point of view, from a supply chain point of view, and then onwards into how we support the machine out there in the world. And then we're going to talk about delivery, all the things that you guys want to see, the things that we're building for you, the technologies we're developing, and the steps that we're taking extremely rapidly to make this helicopter real. And then finally, we'll sum up a few notes on the future that we'll then share together. So it's actually only been eight months since we last met. And tonight, I'm going to show you just how far we've come in that eight months and then what comes next.
Okay. So let's start by talking about the, uh, the journey that we're on together, that we're all sharing. So we all know, the reason we're all here together is we all know that the helicopter can be much, much more than it is today. And together, we're delivering that vision, a helicopter that can be more capable, more desirable, more attainable, more connected, and a support mechanism, a business model that for the first time ever is completely owner-centric towards private owner-operators. That's what we're here to, to talk about. That's what we're here to share. And we're going to show you how we're delivering that for you. So beyond the helicopter itself, one of the questions that we get asked all the time is, so come on, Jace. What makes you different? What makes you different from all the other people that have tried and failed to do this in the past? And the answer is very simple. One of the things that we're doing above all else is we're developing a community. We're building a community of people that share the vision to bring uh, a new start, a reboot to general aviation. And being part of this community is far more uh, than just about helicopter ownership. We, uh, we're building a group of people where we listen to the, uh, the market and we're building the helicopter that you've always wanted to have. We have a totally honest and transparent approach and we operate with complete integrity. And because of that, we're developing an ownership ecosystem all the way around the world where there's a network of owners all over the, the planet sharing HX50s and being able to share the experience in this network of people that we've created. And for that, the journey that we're on today will extend far beyond the development of the helicopter itself. And for that reason, uh, we've now developed a community of people that share in our belief of what the future of light helicopters can be uh, that spans 46 countries and 627 helicopter sales. So we're now up to 516 HX50s and 111 HC50s. You could think of it as the ultimate network around the world. So let's talk a little bit about our approach, the, the reason why we're doing things differently uh, and what that's meant for us and what that involves. So one thing's for certain, if what's going on at the moment isn't working, you simply can't just keep doing the same thing. And so what I'm going to talk to you about briefly now is how we're doing this differently to what people have done in the past. One of the questions that I get asked a lot is, how on earth are you hitting the price point? How do you get the cost of a helicopter down to something not dissimilar from a supercar? And the truth is, that's nothing new. If you go back to 1978, the year I was born, uh, the US alone produced 17,811 light four-seat aircraft. And at that time, in adjusted for today's dollars, the price point was about 80,000 US dollars for a four-seat aeroplane. So it's been done before. I'm not inventing this. But what happened is the supply chain got completely, completely out of control. The issues with American product liability became problematic. And costs, and, uh, costs escalated. And uptake in the industry dwindled, which just made the whole thing worse. In order to reinvent this, we've got to think differently. The supply chain that exists today exists so uh, to serve the large uh, commercial air transport companies that can afford to pay far higher prices for components and systems than a light helicopter company can. So what we've had to do is essentially vertically integrate. We have to make all of these parts ourselves so that we've got control from end to end of the supply chain. Raw material in through the front door at the maximum value that we possibly can here, and then a premium product out the back door. That's what you've got to do to get control of the, uh, the cost of both development and delivery of these aircraft. And that's what's going on right here in DC-1 and DC-2 and DC-3 down the road. Now, the other thing that this does is the moment that you're making everything yourself, 
you've got the flexibility to design what you want. You can design the aircraft the way it needs to be to meet customer expectations. And that's precisely what we're doing here. We've given ourselves complete freedom to innovate. We're able to pull in manufacturing processes and technologies and all the elements that you need to deliver an aerial Grand Tourer and bring them together under one roof. That's the power of vertical integration. The challenge with it, because there's no free lunch, is this means we have a lot to do. We have to invest heavily in people, in manufacturing processes, in infrastructure, and in capability to be able to do all of the things that traditionally a wide network of suppliers would do. And what we're going to show you tonight is a lot of the things that we've been doing to bring all of these things together to deliver the helicopter that we're all looking for. But when you've swallowed that pill and when you've done that work, what happens next is it gives us end-to-end -end control of everything. It means that we can control the cost of the aircraft and we can't be held to ransom by suppliers when we're in production because we make everything. It also means that our spare parts, the way we warranty the aircraft, the support that we can offer to the aircraft can be delivered at a, cost po uh, a price point that hasn't been available for decades. That's the power of uh, vertical integration. The other thing that it gives us, of course, is if we control the cost of the bits, all of a sudden insurance becomes cheaper because the insured value is what it is to me, not what it is to you. And so all of these things are the key drivers behind how we're delivering this amazing helicopter at this incredible price point. In order to do all of these things, essentially to fully capitalize on all of these things, what we're having to do is industrialize the helicopter. So many aircraft companies today start to think of themselves as technology companies. Uh, we're not a technology company. We're a manufacturing company. And our job is to take the best of what's already out there and to bring it together with incredibly talented people to deliver the best industrial design of a modern helicopter using modern manufacturing processes that we possibly can. And so what that means is that within this building, we've essentially got extremely closely coupled design and manufacturing. All of the components that will be on show tonight were designed in that office up there, and all of the mechanical bits were made on these machines behind you right here, which means the guy that makes it gets to talk to the guy that designed it, and they get to communicate freely throughout the whole process. Now, if you're tied up in a lengthy supply chain with lots of stakeholders and people with all sorts of interests in the process, then you never get that rapid convergence towards something that both delivers the performance you want, but also can be made realistically with modern manufacturing processes. That's the key to delivering the price point, the performance, all in one package. And that's what we do right here in this building. Um, the other thing that it allows us to do is when you're responsible for making the stuff as well as designing the stuff, you have to develop the, pro uh, the production processes at the same time as the aircraft. So what we're going to be showing you tonight is a lot of the work that we're doing in developing processes, infrastructure, people, skills, uh, operational controls to control all of those sorts of things um, so that the design fully takes advantage of how we actually want to make these things. Again, that's a bitter pill to take up front, but the benefit of that is when we're finished developing that helicopter, we've got all of the processes, all of the know-how to simply just build a bigger factory. We don't then have to work out how to, uh, to build it. We don't then have a lengthy scale-up process. Everything that we need is developed right here. That's the power of the approach that we're taking. So in order to do all of that, we've spent a lot of time over the last eight months or so building the business that builds the helicopter. You've got to understand what's really required. There's, there's a huge amount of design effort, as I'm sure you understand, to design a helicopter. But when you're designing every part of a helicopter, there's a huge amount of effort goes into designing every little subsystem, every little component, every bit of the engine, all of the avionics, and that sort of stuff 
takes a little bit of time. The other thing we have to do then is develop all of the manufacturing processes and iterate back through that process to make sure that the parts that we're designing can actually be delivered by the processes that we're using to make them. And we have to invest heavily in people, in infrastructure. You'll have seen on some of the updates we've posted the large-scale CNC machining capability, the ovens, the trimming facilities, the composite facilities, the blocking up facilities, all of the things that you need to be able to make these components have to be there first before you can make them and before you can optimize them. And that's what we've been involved in extensively over the last four to six months in particular. The team, including all of our subcontractors and consultants, is now up to 75 people. Uh, we've gone from a single DC that we're sat in today to three development facilities in the local area to cover precision, e precision engineering, composites, and then the, uh, the latter one will soon be the test center. And we're now uh, going through planning permission on our 335,000 square feet production facility. Uh, and to put that in perspective, for people that have driven in the local area, that's about half the size of that Amazon building just down the road here. So all of those things have been going on in parallel to develop uh, this helicopter and the instrument that we need to produce it cost effectively and sustainably into the future. So we're developing as rapidly as anybody can, and we'll show you that tonight. But we can't develop at any cost. The most important things to us here are the um, safety and the quality of the elements that we develop for people. Now, we've given ourselves an intentionally tight timescale. And the reason for that is anybody that's been involved in technology ventures or in uh, any kind of product development will know that engineering can very easily expand to fill the available time. It will go on and on and on and on. Engineers are never finished designing stuff. So we drive a very tight timescale to make sure that we control that as tightly as we can. And that has delivered extremely rapid and cost-effective progress. But now, We've refined information now. We understand what's involved in the extent of vertical integration we need to make gears, to make turbine components, to make composite structures in new and advanced uh, methods. We know the time much more accurately that we're going to need to get this to the level that I'm satisfied to put helicopters out there. So the time is now right for us to review and update the timeline based on the information we now have. So from where we stand today, uh, we are expecting to have a prototype HX50 and a prototype GT50 together uh, by between March and June next year. From that, we will need a further six months to get to first flight. And then from first flight, in parallel with the test flying activities, we'll be taking this facility upscaling to production so we're ready for full-scale production by September 24. So let's talk about how we're delivering this. I've talked a little bit about the vision. I've talked a little bit about the approach. Let's show you just how rapidly we're working through this development. So one of the first areas I want to talk to is the elephant in the room over there, um, which is composites. So composites have featured very heavily in the, uh, the updates and the information that we've put out to date. So let's first explain what's the big deal with composites. Why are composites important? Composites are important because to create the streamlined fuselage that we need, uh, we need to be able to create lovely flowing amorphous shapes. And for that, the, uh, we, we need to be able to create composite structures. This low drag fuselage that we need is what is responsible for the high cruise speed that we have. Most of you guys that have been through helicopter flight school will think that the forward flight speed of helicopters is all to do with advancing tip Mach numbers, retreating blade stall. That's all true, but that really doesn't matter until you get up to about 170, 175 knots. Below that, it's really all about drag. And if you want a helicopter to fly faster with modest amounts of power, it has to be slippery. HX50 was designed that way, and we need composite materials to deliver that. 
The other thing, the other element of performance that's important is the weight. We have to make the, the weight of the aircraft as low as possible. So in order to get a lightweight, large, and streamlined structure, we're required to use composite materials. They give us a significant advantage over aluminum structures. Uh, and that, of course, is what's responsible for the outstanding hover performance of, uh, of HX50. And then the thing that uh, you'll be most uh, interested in, of course, is the game-changing crashworthiness that you get with composite structures. They are fundamentally more crashworthy. It's fundamentally easier to provide completely uh, different levels of crash protection to all occupants on board when you use a composite structure. So we'll talk a little bit about how that structure's uh, uh, configured in, uh, in a moment. And then, of course, the biggest issue is how on earth do you get the cost out of composites? And what we've spent the last two months in particular dealing with is developing the processes to create out of autoclave infused tooling and the one-piece monolage that allows us to develop, uh, basically deploy all of the composite technologies you'd use in other industries to high-integrity aerospace structures. And in just a second, we'll go over there and, uh, and have a look at the structure. I'm going to st start by just explaining what we've been up to to create those molds and those components over there. We've had to develop all of the processes and all of the infrastructure to create this stuff. So we've carried out the process design for both the patterns, uh, the molds, and then the components themselves. We've created the infrastructure, as you can see here. Two months ago, uh, sorry, three, yeah, two months ago, we started with a completely empty unit. And in that period, we've been able to procure the CNC machinery uh, from overseas, bring it over to the UK, install it, get it operational, staff it, uh, procure all of the materials we need, and then make the patterns, make the molds, and then now started to make the components out of that facility in just that short period. Um, the, you will have seen in some of the previous updates that we've uh, shown that the pattern making technique that we use, we've taken from boat building, uh, where it allows us to dramatically reduce the cost of the patterns that we need to make these large scale structures. Uh, and similarly, the mold making is infusion based, which allows us to get the cost of the carbon components down. Um, and then we're into conventional laminating and core and metallics to make the structures itself. Let's go over and talk to Tim Gulland, uh, senior composites engineer, about, we've got a microphone, lads, please, um, about exactly what we've got over here. Tim's going to tell you a bit more about the process, about the materials that we use, Tim, uh, and about next steps. Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Composites Corner. Uh, I'm just looking around the audience here with my glasses to see if I can see any faces I recognize from December, a few new faces. Uh, thank you for, so much for joining us this evening. Uh, we're really looking forward to just giving you a walkthrough of uh, what we've been up to since you last visited us. What you see here is our first attempt at uh, prototype molding for our prototype airframe. Uh, I just, just to demonstrate the size of it, that's our first third scale proof of concept molding that we did to prove that we could infuse the, the airframe in, in a one shot molding. We've now, I think mean Jason's stolen my thunder a little bit, <laughs> uh, but we've, we've covered so much ground in the last two, two months from a, from a standing start. We've got the machine, we've tooled up, we've borrowed heavily from boating industry. We've had advice from experts in boating on how to produce these molds. And you see before you the fruit of, of real hard labor of, of a, a really dedicated team of people. Um, and the mold itself is in, uh, is in a 600 gram biax fiber. It's about nine plies. And I'm just riffing now, so keep up with me. And I'm gonna chuck that out there and feel free to pass it around, yeah. have a little look at that. So, in, in my career as an engineer, I've spent so much time looking down a, a, a CAD tube at, at, at what I'm designing, and, and I always derive a, a supreme satisfaction from, from actually taking some clean sheet of paper and creating a, a viable product, whether it's part of a racing car or, or, or an airframe. Uh, but normally, when, when you see the finished part, which is extremely satisfying, 
you, you hold it in your hand and think, oh, I thought, I thought it was bigger than that, because you've been looking down, in effect, a, a microscope of the CAD tube. You've been zoomed in so close. Well, this, this monster is the biggest thing I've ever worked on. It's absolutely enormous. And it, it took like five of us to lift the sidewalls off, off the patent. It's, it's, uh, it's a real behemoth. Uh, but I know, Jason, you want to talk about structure. Yeah. But before we do, if I may, I just want to do a little shout out to my, my little crew from down DC2 and DC3. Uh, if you're in the audience, boys, feel free to stand up and take a bow. Uh, we'll start off with our composites. Um, manager down there. Dave, where are you, Dave? You there? Come on, on your feet, mate. Good man. Dave, Dave uh, 30, 35 years at Formula One, something like that. Uh, he's come out of retirement, uh, and I think we're going to finish him off with this project. Yeah. If we're, if we're not um, I also want to make a mention to our very dedicated uh, pattern makers, because we're still learning on the machining front, so there's a lot of like touching up and going on of the patterns. Uh, and that's a big well done to Keith. I know you're out there, Keith, somewhere. Uh, and also to uh, our another retired. Come on, Keith, on your feet, mate. Come on. <laughs> and also uh, our other gentleman we brought out of retirement, Mick, who's, I don't think he's with us tonight. Um, a quick mention of our very dedicated laminators. Sorry, I've got a bit of paper. I've, I've reached that age where I need to write people's names down. Uh, Nick, Mick, and Eddie, who are our day, day shift laminators. Uh, and also our night shift boys, who I, I'm, I'm camped in my motorhome next to their unit, and they delight in keeping me up all night, <laughs> grinding things. Alan and Dan, you, you boys are in the audience. There you go. Good. And then, and then finally, uh, to, to Paul, our machine is on you for feet, Paul, come on. Uh, Paul, Paul is actually... Paul has discovered he's actually a pretty good laminator as well, and the, and the rates are better, so he might be changing professions. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's move on to structures. Do you want, do you want to? Yeah, up? very good. So you've previously uh, seen the third scale model that was basically there to demonstrate that we could produce a fuselage in a single piece, no joints, total structural integrity. We've subsequently done a little bit of work over here where we've experimented with paint finishes and generating the level of uh, paint finish and surface finish you'd expect on a half a million pound aircraft. What you probably haven't seen very much of yet is how we go from the molds to a high integrity crash worthy structure. So Tim, do you want to just talk us through the structural foams in here and how we create the load paths that we need to to carry the enormous loads that come from that transmission down into the roof structure and provide this safety yep. shell for the guys to keep them nice and safe? So the idea of, of a, a one-shot molding is that you remove bonded joints and mechanical interfaces, and you, so you have a single structure. So there's, there's no sort of intrinsically weak point in the structure. And what we're going to do is we're going to put down two plies of this 400 gram biax. Uh, it's uh, 12K. It's kind of like equivalent to, to a T700. Anybody who's a competence anorak might know what that means. Two plies of that go in. And that's out there for you guys to have a look at. <laughs> there you go. Feel free to peel back this, the, uh, the um, plastic, because you'll find there's a slight tack to it, which allows us to hang the plies off, off the roof, off the ceiling of the mold, without them sort of raining down on the laminators. We then take our foams. Now, these foams, are, the purpose of them is to provide box sections, structural load paths. So you can see, we haven't got the top foam in there, but you can see the the door frame box sections will be taking the loads from the road ahead and the passengers sat in, inside and the fuel tank and feeding it all through the structure efficiently to, to the top of the airframe. And what we'll do is we'll put, we're going to put three plies of this UD fiber and that fiber will go along the length of each box section because that's the most efficient use of the fiber, aligning the fibers with the direction of the load. Because if we had fibers going at 90 degrees to that, they'd be doing nothing for us but just, just extra weight. So we don't want to do that, do we? Here we go again. Right, some UD. Pass that round, please. Okay. Uh, and then the foams would then go into the molding, and then we'd add another two plies of the 400 gram, which is out there somewhere. Where we have local mechanical interfaces, we would put reinforcing plies. And just to give you an idea of what we're going to do, this is one of the metallic inserts that's going to go into the roof of the airframe. 
Uh, you've seen the gearbox, I hope. You'll see that there are four struts that are going to pick up on inserts, threaded inserts in here, uh, and they will carry the loads. So for that to, to pull out of the airframe, it has to tear through the reinforcing plies, the outside skins, and what we've done is we've linked it with a, with a mechanical tube that links it to the inside skin. Because if we were just relying on, on the foam, more likely than not, the skin would just peel off the top, top of the foam. So feel free to pass it around. I want this one back, OK? You can't keep this one. <laughs> uh, and perhaps one of my assistants can pass these around to people on the other side, please. Alan, if you. So the logic is that um, these mechanical interfaces will not only feed the loads, if you just want to drop them, some people over there, please. Um, carry the loads into the airframe. But what we're going to do is, with our seat back, the middle two mechanical inserts, we're actually going to have uh, aluminum brackets that feed the loads directly into the rear bulkhead. And on the rear bulkhead, there will be rails that go from top to bottom to take the, the seat loads but also to feed the loads all the way through to the undercarriage. Fantastic. And so the only other thing to point out, I would say here, is that when it comes to laminating these things, this is the, uh, the type of rollover rig that we'll use to allow the cabin to be rolled over so that you can lay the carbon fiber into each of the faces that you need to create the structure, bag it, and then infuse it. Yeah, I mean, the only, th only thing to make in addition is that we, we didn't, we've been, I mean, the boys have really pulled out the stops to get this for you this evening, so um, and I really appreciate the effort they put in. But each of, each of the door apertures would be cut out of the mold, the window aperture, baggage hatch. So in effect, it could be twisted through 90 degrees and a laminator could stand inside those apertures and reach up to the floor or, or to the roof of the airframe as required. Are we done? Very good. <laughs> Tim Gulland, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. OK, so I think we're got the presentation back. Let's talk about uh, windshields. When you look at the, the renders that you can see of the aircraft, we've got an awful lot of glazing on the front of this helicopter, and this is a very fast helicopter. So it's essential that we provide adequate levels of crashworthiness and impact protection on the glazing that covers the, essentially the majority of the cabin. Now, Windows, if you're not careful, are another element that can get very, very expensive. And so what we've been doing is developing the processes, the tooling, and all of the technology we need to make all of the transparencies right here in-house. So the first element is, in order to produce um, impact-resistant windows, you have to use polycarbonate. The polycarbonate then needs to be coated to have its hardness improved. It then needs to be coated to provide adequate UV, IR, and tinting uh, films so that you don't roast under the hot sun. And then we need to develop all of the methods to take the forming processes, do a proper industrial engineering job on that, and then to be able to tool and trim those so that when we bring all of these large, complex shapes together, we get the fit, the finish, the, uh, the shut lines that everybody would expect from a premium quality product. And again, all of this has been vertically integrated. When we first started doing this work, um, we, we started doing some test, uh, test specimens by manufacturing a small third scale tool right here in DC1. And we made some initial windows in an in-house oven that we created on the third scale models. With that process technology, we were then able to go scale the tooling up to full scale. We've produced a full set of windows for the entire aircraft at the moment. These test specimens are just in acrylic, but the same tooling is equally applicable to the polycarbonate windows. And so all of that process development is now done. And to put it into perspective, with the cost saving that we will make on making the first uh, 25 sets of windows for ourselves, we will pay for the equipment we need to make them. That's the kind of impact that vertical integration and making stuff in-house has for you. So let's go over here and have a quick look at the, uh, the optics that we've pr produced here. This is another one of the things that you'll realize uh, when you get close to it, just the scale of the aircraft that we're building for you. Um, the upper windows and the, uh, the chin windows provide excellent visibility throughout all of the, the operating range. 
The way we attach the, uh, the transparencies to the aircraft is using bonding like you would in an automotive application. That gives us a nice flush finish, no exposed fasteners. When you get up close to these patterns, you'll notice there are still some marks on these. That's just because essentially these ones have been made with very, very low cost tooling out of model board. When these windows are bonded in, you can see the bonding strips here. When they're bonded into the aircraft, we actually use a, a screen printed primer on the back side of the window with things like dot fade so that you don't see the bonding from the outside. So again, the levels of fit and finish that you will have come to expect in your car are being delivered right here on the in-house manufactured transparencies for HX and HC50. Um, yeah, so that's the, uh, that's the transparencies. <laughs> OK, seats. So when you're developing an aircraft that's really intended to be an aerial Grand Tour or an Aston Martin of the skies, it's absolutely essential that everybody on board gets a first-class experience, a first-class seat, crashworthiness to the highest standards for everybody. And again, in order to deliver that at an affordable price point, this is an area where we've had to invest heavily and develop this kind of technology for ourselves in-house. Now, it's not just about the structural engineering. It's not just about the crashworthiness. It's not just about the systems engineering and the manufacturing engineering we need to do to put this all together. It's really important that at every single touch point for the customer, you get perfection. You get a first class experience the same as you would expect from your high end automobiles or any other high end products that you'd have. And that's what we're seeking to deliver with the crew seat for HX50. So what you're seeing here is essentially work in progress for a multidisciplinary optimization exercise. So we start with the design vision that we want, but then we have to go and essentially create all of the elements that deliver that vision. So in order to create the, uh, the fundamental restraint system for each passenger, we need a carbon structure that's capable of resisting the, um, the crash loads. So we've got thick composite beams at the back here that will hold you firmly in your seat in the event of downward accelerations, forward accelerations, lateral accelerations. The seats are the only thing via the seat belts that tie you to the airframe. So the structural optimization of this thing is absolutely crucial. Beyond that, we then have to pro provide space inside the seat for the seat legs that mount the seat to the floor to stroke upwards by around 245 millimeters. And that will ensure that in the event of an impact, you're able to limit the decelerations into your spine to a level that will allow you to walk away from the accident. And these seats are designed to meet the very latest uh, Part 27 impact standards. So this is the carbon bucket, and again, this is work in progress. This is one that we've purely done to, to get all of these things together. But the seat two will be an infused composite structure. So fusing all of the best bits of composites where you get the high strength, the high stiffness, the very lightweight, uh, and the crash integrity, but with a process that's inexpensive to, uh, to implement in practice. And then in terms of the, the next element of the, the task, that's really to deliver a, uh, a crew seat that's worthy of HX50. So, Misha, I don't know if you want to come and test this out for me. I, I think most people would agree. Are you sure I can sit on this? Yeah, I wouldn't sit on that one if I was you. This is, this is kind of what I'm used to sitting on. Yeah, well, I think, I, we'd, I, think, I think we'd all agree that traditional helicopter seats are instruments of torture for most people. So, uh, do I get to be the first one to sit in an HX50? You just have been. <laughs> this is nice. This is very nice. So what we've tried to do here, it's firm, it's supportive. The seats can't be quite as wide and sculpted as they would be in a sports car because you have to be able to get your, your left arm back to operate the, uh, the collective. But we've tried to balance the, uh, the best bits of automotive design, premium fit and finish and quality with all of the practicalities and the technology you need from a crash-worthy seat. As per the design, we've got the head head uh, set stowage on the back of the uh, on the back of the seat so they're conveniently there oh that's nice yeah and then we've got the the headrest embossed and all the stitch work that you would expect 
from a premium aircraft or a premium, air, uh, a premium seat. And something that you notice, I think, right away is you sit down and it feels quite firm, but the longer you're sitting in here, which I've been sitting a minute now or so, it, it kind of, you sink into it, you mold into it, and it actually gets more comfortable the longer you sit in it. Yeah, well, we've, we've, got, a, we've got a stack of work left to do on this on, on all sorts of areas. Now that we've got the combination of a manufacturing process that works, a structure that's the right size to work, and all the trimmings and the bits and pieces that you need to be able to deliver one of these seats, now we've got to keep going around that, that loop to get everything fully optimized. And part of that work will be doing the comfort trials to optimize the foam, to optimize the seat shape back. Um, but what this delivers is, again, for the price, uh, for the finish, uh, and for all of the, the loads and the standards we need to meet, we are able to make these seats right here at Hill Helicopter. So anybody that was worried that they were going to end up with a seat bench and not what we drew, uh, hopefully we've allayed your fears. And this is the, uh, the seat that you can expect to receive in your helicopter. So is, it, is this how you fly it when you have the autopilot on? I wouldn't recommend that, <laughs> but uh, that's personal choice. OK. OK. So one of the perhaps most icon iconic areas of HX50 is our digital cockpit. A simplified, intuitive, and connected VFR flight deck specifically optimized for the role of a VFR helicopter pilot. So none of the superfluous IFR stuff that you don't need, none of the uh, sort of repeated information or uh, unnecessary information, just the information that you need presented as crisply, as clearly, and delivered in a beautifully designed flight deck package. Now, we've been developing this for a long while. And the basic concept of the, the flight deck was a very clean cockpit, uh, minimize pilot workload, and then with things like your alerts and your warnings, don't take up panel space with lots of bulbs that are never on or should never be on. Don't repeat information. Use modern digital cockpits and animations to bring those things to the forefront as and when you need them, and then provide an experience that's fully connected and completely future-proof. When we came to implement the digital cockpit, and this is something that we've been working on for now over the, the last year, year to 18 months, the original com concept was very simple. You only include in the hardware that we produce the stuff that never changes. So airspeed indicator, altimeter, engine gauges, uh, all those sorts of things, just the fundamentals that will never change as the aircraft ages. Because we're going through somewhat of a revolution at the moment in the way we do VFR flying. In the last 15 to 20 years, everybody has moved over to iPads, electronic flight books, and a much more connected flying experience. Now, if you try and do that within an aircraft, then that stuff's going to age really quickly. I'm sure we've all flown aircraft with really old GPSs, really old VORs, all the stuff that you just don't use anymore. Now, it's important to realize that an aircraft uh, will be in service for a lot longer than a car. Your typical car lasts 10 to 15 years. There's many of us in this room own aircraft that are 40 or 50 years old. Now, an iPad from today isn't going to look too clever in 50 years' time. So the, the original idea of the digi cockpit was we separate all of that stuff so it has a very easy way to keep up with new communications infrastructure, new tablet technologies, all the things that will make flying easier in the future that we can't yet anticipate. Now, when we came to implement the, the aircraft, one of the, uh, the things that we were presented with was the opportunity to add a third screen in the center. Um, and we, we spent a, a great deal of time investigating this, looking at whether it made more sense to host the apps on that center screen so you'd always got everything you needed with you. We looked at Android platforms. We looked at the M1 platform for hosting iPad-based apps. Um, and these were, on the face of it, fantastic opportunities. The reality is that because there's not really a market for running things like 
Android electronic flight book apps on little Android boxes or on M1s. There's no support ecosystem for that at all. So even with generous support from the app developers, the functionality in the M1 version of some of the apps isn't quite there, and there is no will to support these things because we're such a tiny proportion of the, the market for these electronic flight books. So reluctantly, we took the, uh, the decision that the best way to do the digi-cockpit is to stick to the original plan, have two screens, big 15.6-inch screens that deliver all of your primary flight information, and then deal with your communication and deal with your navigation stuff via an iPad, as we always intended to. That will make the aircraft age far more gracefully, and it will make it uh, a, much more, uh, a much easier aircraft to upgrade as the years go by. So that brings us to the next topic for this evening, version two of the digital cockpit. So a simplified, more intuitive, more connected VFR cockpit. It's enhanced, it's refined, and importantly, it's now based on a fully certifiable platform. So what we've done is true to the original concept, two big screens, simple graphics, uh, and it's now based on an all-new delivery platform. We've moved away from the automotive technology, and we've gone to fully certifiable technology. We've also enhanced the visual design of the Digi Cockpit with an in-house design team, and we're now conducting all of the software development for the Digi Cockpit in-house. We've moved over to Trig as a peripheral partner to deliver the radios, the GPS source, the transponders, and various other parts that feed the system. We're still with PS for the audio panel, but this entire system now is being delivered in a way that allows us to keep a consistent, um, uh, a consistent delivery of the Digi Cockpit for both HX50 and also HC50. So here we are. This is the new version of the Digi Cockpit. Two 15.6 inch screens, a PFD on the right hand side, uh, an infotainment screen on the left hand side that can also double as a PFD, a revised and improved IPI that controls all of the key systems on board, and then space for a 12 inch iPad. And this is how the new PFD screen uh, works. So much the same as what you've seen before. We've eliminated the three gauges that you need to monitor a turbine engine, and we have a first limit indicator that's crisp, clear, and easy to use. It changes color and gives you a pop-out warning when you get to your uh, transient power levels. We've got an elegant rotor RPM gauge on the right side, intuitively delivered, up for RPM going up, down for RPM going down. You've got the HSI in the center that can also provide traffic information, a full screen attitude indicator with a pitch, uh, pitch ladder and roll pointer, and then a, a reworked version of our novel uh, altimeter and VSI system. So the altimeter scrolls to make it easy to read. You have a big digital readout to make your radio calls easier. You've got a large VSI on the left-hand side to make it easier for helicopter pilots to watch those critical airspeed and rate of descent uh, combinations with a, a simple speed bar along the bottom. All of the information you're likely to need when you're flying, so your ground speed, your endurance, and your range, dynamically calculated by the system. Your hobs is over there, and your flight time's over there. The engine gauges are minimalistic. They will draw your attention to them if they need so. They'll pop up red if there's a problem. And then we've got a fully integrated suite of controls for the iPad, as uh, for the iPad, for the autopilot on the left-hand side. That's the two-axis setup. The four-axis setup will be slightly more complicated than that. And then a very simple radio bar at the top. This one is uh, fully loaded. So we've got COM1, COM2, and a marine radio. Uh, the bar would just be spaced out for situations where it's uh, uh, a, a single COM radio. The IPI, the Integrated Pilot Interface, uh, we're putting an end to the days where you've got a stack of 15 different boxes with tiny buttons and knobs hidden behind the, the, the cyclic or the collective. We've got a simple automotive-esque control system right integrated into the armrest of the aircraft. So what you see here is the two home pages. The pilot home page that controls your audio panel at the top, frequency input, 
uh, and then your barometric autopilot and transponder settings, and then the infotainment stuff, your air conditioning, your media streaming, your phone, and some of the other settings that, uh, that you'll find. So what we'll do now is we'll go and talk to our uh, avionics spe specialist, Eric, and he's going to demonstrate how this thing works. Because this isn't just pretty pictures. We've actually implemented this. Uh, and according to, to our guys, we think we're about two months away from being ready to fly with this, this suite of technology. So Eric, why don't you uh, show us how this works? Yeah, first off, just to kind of explain what this setup is, uh, this is essentially a demonstrator for our digital cockpit setup. So the screen placements are uh, full scale, of course, and in the right positions that are in relation to your eye point gives you, uh, you know, an accurate representation of what the view will in the, in the different you know, aspect and distances between things would be. And then we have a flight simulator that allows us to simulate data entering the, the digital cockpit, because we're not obviously flying in real life right now, but we can fly in a simulator, outputs all that data into the application, and then we can use that to, to test things and to iterate through the design and to you know, fly, fly it, which is really fun. And it's fully interactive, and so it makes it uh, really good for testing and for seeing how the, the interface works and everything like that. So. OK, so should we see if you can fly? <laughs> Let's see it working. I am not a pilot, so we'll see how this goes. I have had some simulator time, though. Yeah. So I'll just get going here in, a, in uh, the flight simulator. And so it's real time. The, the digital cockpit is getting the information from the simulator. And so it's getting all that nicely. And on the left side here, it, by default, it's the infotainment screen, but we can also uh, change it to also uh, the same, basically a mirror of the of the primary flight display as well. So there's a lot of different options for that. Okay, so let's uh, let's say you're flying along. Why don't you pop it onto autopilot so you can go hands free and you can yeah. show me how the rest of it works. All right. So uh, first, I'm going to set my heading bug. So I'm just going to tap the HSI here and it pops up on the IPI you the the screen here, and I can set the heading bug. And I'm just going to turn the puck here to set it and make sure my airspeed is high enough so the autopilot will engage and try to get everything else here that I need to. So I'm going to turn on the SAS mode and then heading mode. And now autopilot is taking control, and it's banking right to get to my set heading of um, 185 degrees. So for, for guys that are not, not familiar with two-axis autopilots, that thing's now going to hold a heading, hold an attitude, right. keep you flying along straight and level. That's right. Uh, if you wanted to change a, a heading now, how, how would you do that? How do you do it with our well, system? If it's uh, if on the IPI, if the autopilot heading page is open, you just rotate the puck, and it changes the, the set heading and automatically banks to, to okay. acquire that heading. So if I had to divert around uh, some, some airspace yeah, or a restricted area, you can Sit in the comfort of your seat and just that's it, twist rotate the, the puck, and you're good to go. Very good. OK. So let's say we're established en route, and we, we need to change a radio frequency. So let's say, for example, I wanted okay. to talk to, to Birmingham radar on, on 123.890, for example. How, how do we change radio frequencies in this? Sure. So there's two different ways you can go. You can click a button on the PFD, and then it'll open up the IPI, or you can just go right from the IPI, which is what I'm going to do. So I'm going to go and click the comm that I want, open that up, and then, um, sorry, repeat the frequency for? Uh, one, two, three, decimal, nine, eight, zero. OK, so two, three, nine, eight. You don't have to type in the one if you don't want to. And it automatically adds it in there. And I'm going to flip it into uh, the active mode there. So now I've got COM1 active on 123.980. Fantastic. And has it got a, a database? Does it, does it know what all the frequencies are in the, the area? Yes. So, yeah, just... so right, right now, we, we're just pulling a, a database of, of all the frequencies in, in Great Britain. And so yeah. um, of course, that will expand to the world database. Um, but that's obviously a more, lot more data. So when you're testing, it's easier to, to start with a smaller one. So if I, if I highlight this, for example, in the standby frequency, I can just rotate the puck, and it'll just scroll through the database and what frequencies are there ranked um, in order of frequency. So Fantastic. Yeah. So one, one of the things that people often like with traditional uh, panels is the quick access to, right. to features like the audio panel, for example. Yes. I have three small kids, and nothing is more fun in the world than shouting down the intercom when you're, you're flying. So if I wanted to isolate myself and just go into pilot ISO, how, how would I do that? Can I do that immediately when they start shouting? You absolutely can. So you just go back to the home page, and you can, right now it's on pilot ISO already, but you, it's easy to switch between either just your crew having all 
on and or having your okay. pilot. So even though it's a shallow interface, all the stuff that you're likely to need quickly is right there. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Fantastic. And how about things like barometric settings? We've yeah, it's got all a new altimeter setting. How do I put that in? It's all really easy. You can go through the IPI directly or click on the screen. I'm going to go through the screen this time, so I'm just going to press yeah. the the pressure to change the pressure setting right now, and it opens it up in the IPI. I can type it in on the keypad, or I can just rotate the puck. And so I'll just rotate it to um, to standard 1013. So. Fantastic. And then in terms of the, the modes that we're showing here, we've got the, the standard setup here for yeah. the background, right. uh, where we're, we're just using essentially a, a fixed image or a, a yeah. 3D rendered image. Um, there will also be camera feeds behind there. That's right. Uh, and, potential, and also synthetic vision yes. as well for the, the, optional, uh, the, the optional extras. OK, fantastic. Shall we show the limits, perhaps, on the yeah, indicators? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> well remembered, well remembered. So, Part of the, the design philosophy behind this, of course, is that if you pull a limit, it will tell you. And so what we'll get Eric to do now is... Uh, what limit do you want me to break? Uh, pull too much power. That's okay, I'm going to do that. To do. So I'm in the red zone now on the, on the power. And it's, everything changed to red there. And we're still experimenting with different, the best way to indicate to the pilot certain, certain things. But this is um, a decent way of doing it right now. But it'll, it'll be very clear when things so are not in order. A, fe a feature that's coming but's not implemented just yet is when you pull into the yellow power range, which is your five-minute rating, or the red, which is your 30-second rating, then you'll get a pop-out timer. And it'll count down the time that you're allowed to stay in that range uh, without exceeding what we've assumed in the duty cycle for the engine. So it gives you complete transparency, complete accountability for how the helicopter's been used. And of course, it, it records all of that. How about the transponder? Where's the, the transponder? Yeah, transponder. So again, similar, uh, similar setup. You just tap it here in the PFD, and it open, opens it up here on the IPI. And you can rotate the puck. This time, I'm going to set it just with the keypad. So I'll just do 2, 6, 8. Uh, I guess it's octal, so it can't be 9, 7, 4. And hit Enter. And now it's set. You can see it here on the, on the PFD. And uh, yeah, pretty straightforward. Fantastic. I think that's looking great. It's in great shape. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> so in reality, it won't be a flight simulator feeding the data. Uh, it'll be some magic boxes over there. So Mart, are you around somewhere? Should we just explain what the, uh, the peripherals are over here? So it's a, essentially a, ro a remote mount system, isn't it? We've got a, a set of screens up front, and then a number of systems around the aircraft that we mount where it suits us. Do you want to just explain what these key elements of the system are? So what's this, for example? Oh, yeah. So here we've got uh, a lot of the detail that's around or behind the scenes, if you like. So here is an air traffic control tran transponder, standard fit, uh, the airband radio that we're just tuning, the intercom, we have a, a GPS source. Um, in fact, the only thing that's really missing from this table is uh, an air data and AHAS, ADAHAS. Um, and I think you know, once we add an ADAHAS to this, we've got all the peripheral sensors, from an avionics perspective anyway, to go fly. So um, around this, we've got um, the bits for the IPI. So we're, we're obviously not going to make screens ourselves, but we're going to buy in the screens, the encoder, we build the puck, um, and the, uh, the driver board for the screens. Uh, and then we've got some circuit, pre circuit breaker protection, high, cu high current contactors here, um, and some of the sort of detail that we've got around the electrical wiring system. Fantastic. OK. And just qualify that remark I made earlier. I mean, you've got a lot of experience in avionics. You're a former head of avionics at, at Leonardo. You're, you're satisfied that we're essentially two months away from the point where we could test fly this stuff? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a suitably qualified test pilot, then I think we're a couple of months away from, from having a user interface that we, go, we can go fly. Fantastic. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> OK, let's talk about some jewelry. So uh, you've probably heard me say before that a helicopter is far more machine uh, than it is aircraft. So in order to make uh, a world-class helicopter, you really have to master the perfection of producing the sort of mechanical jewelry that's required to, uh, to make a helicopter work really well. 
So one of the things that we've been speaking at length about now for about 18 months is the production of gearboxes in-house, the production of gears in-house, and the production of bearings in-house. These are things that you have to control the cost of to be able to deliver a, uh, a product at a price that the general aviation market can withstand. Now, these are incredibly difficult things to make. And one of our strategies is to go ahead and make all of the difficult bits first. Anyone can make a bracket, anybody can make a door. The things that are really difficult are gears, bearings, compressors, turbine blades, and complex castings that you find inside the engine. So if we take gear manufacturing first, this is a, these are products where we're needing to hit tolerances down in single figure microns just to get them to work right and to be reliable. Um, we've developed manufacturing processes of aerospace quality in aerospace quality uh, materials. And for a lot of the gears that fill that main rotor gearbox there, some of which are on the table uh, and some of which are in this, this video behind me, it's typically a 30 to 40 stage process to make each one of those. So the level of detail, the level of quality control is absolutely enormous. And that's uh, been a, a focused effort now for 18 months. And the gears that make up that main rotor transmission over there uh, have all been made entirely in-house, predominantly on the lathe that's hiding behind there and our five-axis machine over there. These are not expensive machines. They're they're run and operated very carefully. As soon as we've got all the seats back out of here, we'll be installing air conditioning in here to keep this at the temperature controls that we need to be able to control the tolerances, to hit the tolerances and the quality that we need on these gear parts. We've actually engineered 17 different gear components for the gearboxes and the drivetrain. Uh, and we're now developing production grade processes. So not only the processes you need to make a prototype, but also all of the inspection protocols. That's the CMM, it's a bit full at the moment, but that's the CMM room over there where we measure these things in house and we can prove that the components that we've designed and the components we've made meet the specifications set out in the, uh, in the design. And all of that work has to be done before you get to make one gearbox. So again, it's important people understand that in order to scale into production rapidly, you have to do this stuff first. You have to do the legwork. So let's talk about some difficult bits. Let's talk about the very first HX50 main rotor transmission, notoriously one of the most difficult parts of a helicopter to make, particularly as the power and torque goes up. These components have to be ultra high integrity. The, the flaws that could cause a, cause a catastrophic failure in a gear are so small that they're practically indetectable uh, with most NDT methods. So we have to use steel grades that are 10 times the price of industrial steel to get the cleanliness of the material to be able to ensure the integrity of those gears. So what we've been doing here is developing the processes, the methods, the sourcing the materials we need to be able to make the main rotor transmission. Now, those of you that have been following us for a while will know we've got a two-stage gearbox. It has a spiral bevel first stage and then a planetary second stage. We get comments quite, a, quite frequently as, why not just have a bigger uh, spiral bevel stage or a, a two-stage spiral bevel? Wouldn't it, be, uh, wouldn't it be simpler? Yes, it would be simpler, but it would be heavier. Um, the, this is by far and away the lightest uh, and most effective way to do a helicopter gearbox as the power and torque starts to creep up a little bit. Um, what we've got over here, we'll just go over here and have a look at it. I don't know if you want to come and just turn this on for me, Craig. Uh, this is essentially our main rotor test rig. So the purpose of this rig here is essentially a process demonstrator for proving that we can make all of the components that go into the main rotor transmission. So all of the gears have been designed, all the work holding, all the tooling, all the fixturing, all of the programming for the CNCs, all of that has been done to deliver this first machine. And then what you can see on here is essentially uh, a, a test rig to validate the lubrication system that we have going on in here. Gearboxes live and die by the lubrication. When you've got this much power and torque going through a gearbox, we have to cool the teeth very carefully. We have to make sure that the lu they're lubricated properly to avoid all sorts of pitfalls that could either cause a catastrophic failure or a fatigue failure over time. Um, you'll also see on here 
that we've got the oil pump at the back here. We've got the rotor disc brake here, the rotor brake caliper. You'll notice this is a fairly substantial arrangement like you get on a larger helicopter. So we should be able to avoid all of the judder that you find in, in some helicopters. And then this manifold that we've got on the front here uh, is essentially something to allow us to tune the airflow into uh, airflow, tune the oil flow into all of the different ports. Now the hoses and things you can see around the outside, they're essentially prototype only. In reality, this first casing, which has been machined from solid, will be cast and then we'll only machine the bearing pockets and the interface faces to get the cost of production down to where it needs to be. But because we're machining from solid, it then means that we can't get the oil galleries into the part when we machine it. So those are running externally at the moment to allow us to, to prototype that. The other thing that you'll see here is um, we've obviously popped some, some windows in to allow us to do those, those tests. If I just explain for a moment how the gearbox works structurally, the main rotor head attaches to the top and carries all of the primary flight loads. The torque that the gearbox produces is actually resisted by these two lugs you can see on the front and back of the gearbox. All the lifting loads are carried by these, three, uh, these four struts that are shown on the gearbox. Now, when HX50 enters service, these will just be passive struts. But one of the next steps that we will take is to convert these to active struts so that we can essentially provide an active damping system to eliminate uh, the vibration that you get in the cabin or to tune the vibration to a far greater extent than has been done to date in, in light helicopters. So that's the, the main rotor gearbox and the, the test stand. We're incredibly pleased with how well that's come together. It's been a monumental effort both in uh, process development, chasing tiny tolerances, uh, and, and bringing the whole thing together in its assembly. Um, and I'd just like to say thank you to Craig, our chief transmission designer, and Mark, our chief production engineer, that have been tearing their hair out now for about a month and a half trying to get this, uh, this finished. So thank you, Craig. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Mick, as well. Sorry, Craig, I forgot something <laughs> with, with, with the uh, sensor as well. So if you get a chance to come up and have a look at this later, uh, you'll notice the, the, the level of complexity in some of the parts that we have to make uh, in order to be able to combine functions between different gears, eliminate the number of parts that we've got in the, well, reduce the number of parts we've got in the gearbox, and give the lightweight, compact transmission that we need. Um, the other gears that we've got over here, these are not gears out of the ge gearbox. These are actually uh, an international standard shape gear that we use to do the fatigue testing on the gears. And by doing fatigue testing on these specimens that are process representative of our manufacturing processes, we can then validate the performance of this thing before we put it on an enormous test rig for 5,000 hours. Uh, we get to give ourselves a great deal of confidence that that will pass the tests that we subject it to. So what you might notice here, uh, this little cable, is your rotor speed sensor. So we've got an eddy current sensor that picks up on the passage of teeth as the, uh, it's the, sp uh, the top the spiral bevel gear, sorry, the spiral bevel gear goes past. But this type of sensor can do much more than that. We've spoken quite a lot about the hum system that will come with the aircraft and the monitoring, the health monitoring that comes embedded in the digi cockpit and communicated through the, the Hill app. And what you can see here is the waveform that that sensor is creating. Now, ordinarily, you would just do sufficient signal processing to be able to count the passage of teeth and give you an accurate speed sensor. But you can also calibrate that with some enhanced signal processing to start to qualify the types of defects that can occur in these gears. So if we start to detect surface wear or cracks or other defects that can become potentially hazardous, then with adequate signal processing of this signal, that is the kind of data that we collect from, from sensors and systems that are already on board the aircraft to ensure that the aircraft remains fit for purpose as it goes through its service life. So that's the, uh, the first of the main rotor transmissions. 
So let's talk briefly about the GT50 engine. It's the very heart of HX50, and it's the thing that more than anything else sets us apart in terms of our approach and the level of performance and cost that we can get out of the aircraft. Envisaged to be light, powerful, inexpensive, electronically controlled, and entirely manufactured by us. Importantly, in this day and age, it's also been designed from the ground up to be biofuel ready or sustainable aviation fuel ready. So we can deliver carbon neutrality faster than any other method out there. However, as we've gone through the development uh, process and we've communicated this over the, uh, the app, it's become very clear that we had a kind of once-in-a-decade opportunity to make HX50 better than we envisaged it in the first place. Lighter, simpler, and more reliable. We've communicated to you in previous updates how we've had to re-engineer the combustion system. We've gone to an annular combustor from the traditional can combustors. We've developed an all-new SAS system that gives us better control over the temperatures in the core of the engine, better balancing of the bearing loads, better bearing life. Uh, we've now gone and developed the fuel and lubrication systems uh, from a system perspective, and we've done extensive development of the manufacturing processes. We've uh, We've communicated extensively uh, about the work that we've been doing on the compressor. We started back at Christmas developing an, uh, an aluminium compressor to be able to develop the work holding, the tooling, the machining strategies. But as you can see over here, what we actually need is a, uh, a titanium impeller to get the levels of performance and reliability. So what you can see on the screen here is the fruit of all that labor. At the front of the engine, you can see uh, direct drive starter generator unit, about one third the weight of a conventional starter generator, complete elimination of all of the gear train directly driven at high speed. The standard inlet remains unchanged, but now we've got a much more compact version of the, uh, of the combustion system, a much more compact high performance diffuser. And those modifications in their own right have essentially taken about 40 kilos out of the weight of the engine. So it has a profound impact on the performance, the size, and the packaging of the, uh, of the engine. So if we go over here, what I can show you is essentially the first GT50 gas generator and power turbine rotor. So for those of you that are, that are not familiar, um, the HX50 has a two-shaft engine design. The compressor is the, the element that com compresses the air, and then it's driven by a two-stage compressor turbine. So we use two stages rather than one because it makes it much easier for us to hit the efficiency. It's very, very simple to make a powerful jet engine. It's not easy to make an efficient jet engine, particularly at small scales like this. So details like the way we seal the labyrinth, uh, the way we use labyrinth seals and seal the secondary air system, uh, and the way that we ensure that each of these components is operating as close to their sweet spot as possible is vital to delivering uh, the fuel economy that allows us the freedom to use large amounts of power. If we if we had a, a powerful engine and terrible fuel consumption, essentially you wouldn't be carrying any passengers, it would just be a big fuel tank. So this is the very first titanium GT50 compressor, and this compressor itself is ready to go to test. These two turbines here, the compressor turbines and the compressor nozzles, are essentially the analogies of what we did at Christmas with the compressor. These are machined from aluminium to develop the machining strategies for the, these components, and those, those, strat those strategies help us in two areas. For production, in the first instance, we'll be machining wax patterns and then casting these components from super alloy. For the prototype units, we'll actually machine these directly from a slightly lower grade material. It'll allow us to do all the tests we need, but it just won't have the same life as the full components do. And that, again, allows us to rapidly iterate through tuning the nozzles, the blade angles, the balance between the turbine and the compressor, and everything else we need to do to get this thing running sweetly. And then at the back here, this little thing is your power turbine. And that is essentially what generates the full 500 horsepower for your engine. And on a cold day, it'll do a lot, lot more. So what we have here now is a suite of the core engine technologies that will allow us to start testing the, some of the turbo machinery and give us the basis to now wrap the rest of the engine around these key elements. 
So the GT50 is maturing very nicely, and the new configuration of the design is smaller, lighter, and more reliable than it ever has been before. So developing the aircraft, the engine, the avionics, and all the other stuff we have to do is really just the beginning of what we've got to do to bring this aircraft to market. Then we need to build a factory large enough to cope with the incredible demand that we found. And so one of the things that has consumed a lot of my time over the course of the, the last 12 months or so is getting us to a position where, from an infrastructure point of view, we're production ready. And also getting us to a position where we have resilience in our ability to get into production using these methods we've developed as quickly as possible. We now have a site for our global headquarters selected. It's a 335,000 square foot facility. Uh, there is an existing planning consent in place. It's pending a, a change of purpose for, for our specific use. And that's the facility where we'll be able to conduct the scale of state-of-the-art manufacturing that we need to. In the short term, however, as the production activities grow within the business for prototyping and bringing more and more of these processes in-house, we'll, we will continue to execute a phased expansion of the development facilities. We've got three at the moment. I expect we'll have at least another one or two uh, within the next six months or so to keep us progressing at the rate that we are. So this is our global headquarters. This is essentially where the vast majority of our aircraft will be produced. So let's take a moment now to just reflect and talk about the future that we have ahead of us. What I've done this evening is I've reminded you of our shared vision for what the future of general aviation can be, a new product that will get people excited about flying again and give them a product and an operating ecosystem that they can afford to operate. We've shown that together we've built a community that has the strength and the capability to deliver this machine to market. And then we've created the infrastructure to be able to deliver GA 2.0. All of the manufacturing processes that you need to be able to make this thing at the price point that's required to make flying viable again. And then what we've also shown now is that through our vertical integration, through doing the productionization now as we develop, we have a rapid path now to volume production. So, the next time we meet, there'll be two very special people in the hangar, people, things. The next, uh, the next meetup that we schedule will be scheduled for when both the GT50 and also HX50 will be here in the hangar with us. And as I mentioned earlier, I expect that to be somewhere between March and June in the coming year. So not too much longer to wait before the things are on the floor with us. In the meantime, we're going to get our heads down and we're going to get through the remainder of this development to develop the parts, to develop the processes so that we're ready for rapid expansion into production. On that note, I'd like to say uh, thank you very much for, for listening to me. I'd also like to say thank you to our amazing team of staff. Uh, we've created some amazing pieces of engineering, the digi-cockpit, the gearbox, the turbine, the huge effort that's gone into the, uh, the composite structure. None of this would have been possible without the buy-in from our incredible team. Uh, and so, Guys, thank you very much. None of us could do this without you. So thank you to everybody that works at home. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, the people that have worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make this event happen. So Claire Barber, our customer relationship manager, uh, has worked tirelessly. <laughs> These, these events have, have become quite a big deal to organize, uh, and, and Claire has been running around with her hair on fire trying to make sure everything's been here on time. So Claire, where are you? Do you want to come up here for a second? We've got a little something for you. Come on. 
So many of you will have spoken to Claire organizing the event, making sure you all turned up on the right day. And so Claire, thank you very much for everything you've done. And here's a little, oh a little thank you for it. You're very welcome. And then many of you will also be aware of Anna and Lydia that have worked tirelessly behind the scenes as well. Come on up here. I think in the early days, many of you will have spoken to Anna, and more recently, Lydia's been working behind the scenes tirelessly to keep us all organized. So we've got a little thank you for you girls as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Cheers, Lydia. Thank you. There we go. And then one final thing. Uh, I'm told that we have a birthday boy in the room. So, uh, Elvie Miller, happy birthday, sir. Welcome to... Uh, to Hill Helicopters. And on that note, I shall sit down and have a little drink of water. <laughs> Let's open the floor Thank to questions. Thank you, Jason. Amazing. So now it's time to transition to our uh, Q&A session. Um, we're going to be doing that in just a couple minutes. So for everybody that's online, you guys all have a chat there. Um, take a couple minutes here. Send all your questions in the chat. We're going to be going over as many of those as we can tonight. Uh, Jason is wordy. He likes to speak a lot. So we're, we're a few minutes behind schedule, uh, which is OK, because there's so many amazing things for us to see here. And uh, so we're going to take a little bit less time for the Q&A. Um, everybody in the room, start thinking of your questions. We're going to have a couple of mics that we're going to be passing around. And uh, so put your hand up nice and high so we can see you. And then we'll pass the mic to you. And then we'll go to questions that are uh, coming in online as well. Um, now, we just want to do something fun, Ruben. Exactly. Just relax a little bit. By the way, what about standing up a little bit? Because it'll be almost sleepy. We stand up a little bit. Have All a right, uh, much better. Okay, yeah. thank you. The ones that want to see, just uh, be seated. So we have just a little thing here, which is two questions to see if you paid attention. And that is, I have a question. Michelle has a question about Jason's presentation. So <laughs> one is, attention? I hope you were paying attention. Nobody fell asleep, right? Let's see. <laughs> Anybody remembers what is the key factor in the strategic decision of Hill? to actually achieve the price point of the whole helicopter. What is the strategic? Put your hand, hand up. Your hand there, Dino. Vertical integration. You have a jacket. <laughs> <laughs> you have a jacket of hill. There you go. The first one. Sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Great. Now, if it's not the right size or the right color, yeah, we'll change it after. And, uh, okay. and you'll be able to get that for right. you. OK, second question, you guys. On the starter generator on the engine, on the turbine, it's lighter than the other ones that are on the market today. Anybody remember how much lighter it is? How, percentage-wise, how much lighter? 30%. There we go. <laughs> Are you good? Pay attention. One, one third, A lot of hands I up. think, is what you meant to say. One third. <laughs> all right, let's move to the Q&A. First of all, uh, people are here. They want to ask questions. We have a lot also online. By the way, today we broke all records. More than 2,000 people watch us live here. Amazing. Amazing. 2,000 people. Woo! Thank you. Woo! Very nice. So questions from the audience. You can sit down now. Yes. So questions from the audience. Do you want to address to Jason? Please go ahead. So Steve has the first one. We have mics here. OK, we got mics coming and around. And then we have several hands on uh, this race. Let's go one. with Steve first. Yep. And then we go with you the rest. Can stay, you can stay seated, yeah. and uh, the ladies will come to you with the mic. Steve over here on the right. Perfect. Hey there. First, uh, Jason, great presentation. Um, Thank you. Question for you. Just trying to go as fast as I can. You mentioned that the, uh, d the static uh, struts will be, as the helicopter comes into service, active struts later, I think, mm. as you implied. Is there going to be a retrofit process, or how do, the, how do the early owners move to active struts? Uh, at the moment, I see no reason why that wouldn't be possible. Uh, but the devil's in the detail. So we, at the moment, the, the structure has been designed for passive struts, or is being designed for passive struts. We might need to tweak something in the structure to make that work properly. But at the moment, I'd be open-minded to that. I'd certainly want that to be the case. Good. OK, next question. You guys, hands up nice and high. Yes, right here. Thank you. Hello. Um, Hello. I've had a lovely afternoon. Thank you very much. 
Um, I just wanted to ask, it's probably a very girly question, how many can you make in a year once you get your production going? How long will I have to wait for my toy? Yeah, that was, that's a very good question, and I should have said that in the presentation. You, you missed uh, that, Jason. We, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's been a busy day. <laughs> um, the, the factory that I've just shown you is designed to start production at 500 units a year, and it has the capacity to scale to 1,000 units a year when demand gets there. So, mm -hmm. It will get there yes. soon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Next question. All right. So I'm more hands over here. There's one here. Oh, as one well. here, right here. Yeah. Toss out one here. Mike over here, left side. Who has the mic? Anna? Mike over here. <laughs> oh. Oh, no, sorry. There's one here first. <laughs> then we'll go with you. You can go first. That's why I didn't see you. Cool. Um, so in the Cabri, it's a Fenestron, and so you have to use a lot of right pedal. Um, how, I, I read that this was not a Fenestron, and you don't have that um, non-linear power delivery. How, how? So it looks like a Fenestron. It's Fenestron. definitely not a Fenestron, because <laughs> Fenestron is a uh, Airbus trademark. <laughs> 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 so it's a ducted fan anti-torque device. Um, and fundamentally, yeah, the, there's a characteristic where the, because uh, a proportion of your tail rotor th thrust is generated by the flow around the lips of the duct, then you don't get the same linear response naturally. With 50% pedal doesn't mean 50% thrust. It means a little bit less. So what we've done to eliminate that effect is we've changed the control rigging so that it'll compensate with the amount of, of pedal to make it feel more linear. Now, there's another characteristic that you will have to get used to, which is the fact that uh, ducted fan uh, anti-torque devices tend to require bigger vertical fins. So when you're starting to reduce your speed as you come in from a, a descent, you start to slow down, you'll lose uh, a bigger proportion of your anti-torque because the fin is doing more for you until later. So you'll still feel like you need more left pedal uh, in, in HX50 than if you're used to a, an open tail rotor. But it's just a question of flight training. You know, if you do the, do the training, you'll get used to it in no time at all. Thank you. Excellent. OK. Next question's over here. Hi, great presentation. Thank you. Can you clarify the fuel filler cap? Is it inside the baggage door? Or no, outside? no. We, we put it there, and we've, we were very quickly told off by the customer base. There's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a number of, uh, of reasons why you don't want it there. You don't want rotors running refueling with the baggage bay door open and all these sorts of things. So it's going back to broadly where it was before. On the roof, uh, in the blackout at the back of the windows is the most likely location for it at the moment. So yeah, we've, we've backpedaled quickly on that one. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Another question from over here. As we get the mic there, let's go with one online as well. Um, can you explain the mold making steps and then the steps to make each airframe once the mold is complete? Yeah. So uh, to, to make the molds, you first have to make patterns. So if I, if I wanted to make a, a composite structure like this water bottle, if that's what I'm trying to finish up with, I've got to make a mold that will create that structure. So I need a mold that wraps around all the sides of it. That's what you can see over there. That, although that fuselage is a little small for that mold, you can see the idea. The mold creates the shape around the outside. We put the fibers on the inside. And then we split the mold to get the part out. Now, to create the mold, I need something that makes that shape. So first, we have to make patterns. And our pattern making process uses essentially a combination of a boat building technique and a couple of other bits and pieces that we've pulled together to do that at very large scale uh, at low cost. So we make uh, the shape of the mold that we're trying to make as a pattern out of polystyrene. We then seal that, and we use a thin layer of a tooling board material to create the fine surface finish that we need. Once we've done that, we can take carbon molds. And we'll need to have about 10 sets of these uh, in the factory, plus some spares, so that we can keep various airframes being manufactured uh, in parallel. Um, and then once you've got to that stage, what happens is each of these molds are likely to be laid up individually. So if we start with the belly mold, you take your belly mold, you'll lay your first carbon fiber plies into that. Some of those plies will come pre-kitted, 
So there'll be clumps of carbon fiber that are cut to shape and kitted that you can just drop into the mold. The foams there that you see inside the airframe, they're really only there to create the shape of the top layer of carbon that you want, to make it into a box section, as it, as it were. So the, the foam cores then go in, and then again, another kitted set of plies will come into each of those, uh, each of those molds. We then bring the molds together, and the, 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 the laminating is done with dog ears, so we can then fold the, the, the adjacent bits of carbon together where the joints are, so that we've got continuous carbon fiber all the way around the mold. The, the, the interior space then is then vacuum bagged, so on the composite slide, you will have seen some big blue wrinkly bags, and what we do there is we draw all of the air out of the void between the tool and the outside world to compact the carbon and create a high um, carbon content composite. Um, and that's, that's the basic process. Once we've done that, it'll cure for a little while in the tool, and then it'll have to go off to an oven for post-cure, hence why we need multiple sets of tools to have different uh, fuselages, fuselages at different stages of production. So once you're in production, how long will it take to create a full fuselage? I think you'll be looking at one to two days uh, when everything is teed up, but there'll be some support work going on in the background to help with that. Um, a lot of the, the laminating and a lot of the kitting is incredibly time consuming at the moment because the guys are doing it all by hand. Yep. Uh, we'll use XY tables, the equivalent of a CNC machine, to cut the shapes of the carbon, vacuum uh, picking equipment to pick them up and kit it together, and then we'll thermoform some of those things so that they go into the tool preformed. So that whole process has got to be productionized once we've got the basic structure to where we want it to be. Okay. Right, Charlie. Uh, two questions, Jason. Hey, Charlie. Um, there's a major component that you haven't yet touched on, yeah. which is the main rotor blades. Can they re reasonably be left until much later in development because they're that straightforward? Uh, essentially, it's a, an area that we have higher confidence with. So it's been a strategic decision to do the stuff that is, I, I always said when we started this, we wouldn't do technology development, we would just implement what's there, but some of the things that we've done are right at the edge of what's currently practical, so we needed to get those things in the bag first. The main rotor hub and the main rotor blades, I'm not worried about because it's a very, very, it's very cleverly packaged, but it's a very simple design. And so our, our blades are predominantly glass fiber blades, like the majority of larger helicopters. They've got a bit of carbon in them. And then it's essentially a, a relatively straightforward structural optimization exercise to get that, to get that done. The hub is very similar to a, a, an architecture of a hub that you'll see out there. And as you're aware, we've been developing the spheriflex bearings in the background. Um, well, orbital elastomeric bearings in the, the background uh, to be able to bring that together. So I'm, I'm not worried about that. The aerodynamic design of all of that was done a long time ago. It's only the mechanical packaging and the, uh, the structural design okay. that that's, yeah. it's, it's there, it's there. The other, the other reason why it hasn't received um, too much attention is it relies on two of us in the company that have been very, very busy. So it's something that I need to be involved in, and it's something that uh, another member of staff needs to be involved in for it to get to where I want it to be. Okay. Second question is, recently I saw a home safe device demonstrated in flight yeah. uh, in a NEM 600 uh, fixed wing aircraft. Yeah. It was amazing what it is capable of doing in relatively short uh, order and in, in relatively light weight, and I believe relatively cheap. If the full autopilot is an option in the HX50, is it possible to have a home safe device? Yes, absolutely. If you specify the, the four axis autopilot, that will become available to you in due course. Um, what I would say is there are a lot of things that we need to do to get that to the point where we'd be happy to release it, which is why it's not on the options list at the moment. We've got to, we've got to choose our fights at the moment. We've got to just path of least resistance to get all the key things working, and then we'll keep rolling out things uh, once, the, once the machine's in service. Understood, like that. and thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. Another question from the audience while we're getting the mic to them, uh, another one online, so it's HGC related. Um, will the uh, limits that we mentioned, will they have an audible alarm that goes along with them? Yes. So you'll get an audible alarm in your, your headset. And we, again, there's a the 
HX50 has a, a range of ways of communicating to you. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got haptic feedback on all of the controls, so uh, changing force gradients and stick shakers and all of that sort of stuff. And we've got to balance very carefully uh, the amount of stimulation that we, we give a pilot and yeah. the types of stimulation that we give a, a pilot to, to make sure it doesn't just become it's always doing something to you, so you just ignore it. Right. So yeah, they'll be, they'll be audible. You've seen the visual ones. Yeah. Uh, and they'll be haptics as well. But it's very much uh, that's one for the simulator, and that's one for flight test to tune exactly how we want those to work together. Perfect. OK, there's I a know question it's there. Early, but do you have any more detail on the 51% we're going to build, what the process looks like, and really how long? And what not, we not yet. So we, we, gave, we gave an outline of that a long time ago. Um, and that, that's broadly where we stand. Nothing's changed. Um, at the moment, we're in the weeds. You know, we're, we're de developing all of this. We're developing all the production processes. We're developing everything that we need to then come back and say, right, this is how each of the stages are, are, are going to be involved. Um, what I would say is with the way this aircraft has been designed, the kinds of production infrastructure that we're put, putting together, um, this thing will be built very quickly. Uh, and a lot of the, the, 50, a lot of the, the build school program will be intended to educate you as much as have you involved in the, the build process. What I'm trying to do is create competent, independent owner operators so you know enough about your machine to, to know how to keep yourself safe. Well, and a question online. What will be the protocol and frequency of main rotor track and balance tuning? Mm -hmm. uh, again, at, at the moment, we haven't looked at that in any great detail because until we've got the structural design of the blades finished, it's, it's totally up in the air. Um, there are some different things that British helicopter manufacturers have, have done with track and balance to, to other people around the world, and I'm quite interested in those. Um, but all I would say is it will be a much more automated uh, process than it has been to date. So you can expect that to be part of the app you can expect some of the hardware to remain on the helicopter. Perfect. We've got a question right up there as well. Go ahead. Yeah, when it, uh, when it comes to the audible feedback from the helicopter, will we get to choose between Jason, Misha, and Ruben for <laughs> voiceover? Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you wouldn't want me shouting at you. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't want my accent, so. Yeah. <laughs> I already have too many students that have me in their head. Yeah. Just, why are you always talking to me? <laughs> Steve, sorry. <laughs> All right, uh, we're going to go for another question in the audience. In the meantime, uh, we have one about hot and humid environments. Yeah. Uh, I heard the windscreens are UV and IR protected. What is the plan to deal with a heat-soaked cabin when it's parked on the tarmac? Any active vent ventilation when parked, considering, let's say, a 40-degree day outside? Yeah, there'll be some passive there'll be some passive ventilation in there. Uh, again, you've got to, you've got to uh, remember, we need to keep the aircraft as simple as we possibly can, because all of these extra sensors, all of these extra actuators and things will just be a nightmare when the aircraft's 20 years old. Yeah. So we're, we're trying to keep it as simple as possible. There'll be some passive ventilation, and people that live in those climates will be used to dealing with, with them. I think the, the IR and the UV suppression mm. will make a big difference, yeah. uh, far more than I think people realize. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same technology that's essentially used on, on big glazed buildings in the hottest parts of the world. Yeah. So it'll, it'll make uh, a massive difference to what we used to. A question, sorry, yep. question that I just thought about uh, on this topic. Um, have you thought about Hill creating you know, the visors that you put inside the aircraft uh, yeah. to, to cover up the windscreen? We've absolutely thought about it. We haven't yep. done anything about it yet. Okay. So yeah, it'll, yep. it'll come. Something that you can stuff easily in the baggage compartment. Yeah. And we have a gentleman there with a question. Go ahead. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I've got a financial question. It's possible that someone in the audience might have to advise us on this. A large chunk of the purchase price is going to be VAT, or well, 20%, obviously. Um, and for a private owner, that could be quite challenging to reclaim the VAT. I don't know if anyone's thought through this one, because obviously we can't let it out commercially, in insurance-wise, as I understand it. So um, has anyone got an idea of how we might run a scheme that we perhaps could share with all the owners where the VAT could be reclaimable, or is that just not possible? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that's one that you'd have to take some advice for from your, your, your accountants. I was hoping it's, somebody... It's, or, it's, or change the government. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really control that one. So, so nobody in the audience, I wonder there's lots of financial people here, wealthy people that maybe have thought this through, no? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, that's a shot. Yeah, uh, Charlie yeah. is offering his uh, advice, his experience on that. He just raised his hand. Can you raise your hand? Mm -hmm. Here you have Charlie. You can talk with Charlie after. Okay? Yeah. Great. We have another Charlie. question from the audience, well, well, the online, mm -hmm. which is a very uh, important, I'll say, structural question. We get this a lot. Mm -hmm. and I want to hear it from you, which is what are the plans for after service support, parts, warranty? How is it executed in countries, for example, in this case, Ontario, Canada? Okay, so the, the beauty of the fact that we make all the bits means that the bits have the lowest possible price to us. And what that means uh, in terms of, of, of ownership is it means we can provide comprehensive support, we can carry comprehensive stocks of parts because essentially we're only living with the, the manufacturing cost of these parts to hold them and to make them. So our strategy will be to increase the parts inventory in the, the factory here in the UK and then as huge centres, uh, as big centres of, of clusters of customers start to build up around the world, we'll create parts stocks with local distributors and support centres around the world. Our model at the moment is very centralized, but as the fleet grows, then it will be essential that the machines are supported locally. Um, each of the machines that we've, we've sold has been sold with maintenance training for your local mechanics, so that we will train them, we will support your mechanics, and they will deliver the support to you on the field, in, on the ground, in the field, in, uh, in the various countries from which you've, uh, you've, uh, you've come. Um, so yeah, that, that's, the, that's the basic plan. And obviously the aircraft comes with a five-year nose-to-tail warranty as well. So parts really aren't your problem for at least the first five years, which will give us enough time to, to get the distributor network set up and out there. Perfect. Uh, where's our next question from the audience? Do we have a hand in the audience? Yeah, right over here. Anna, yeah, thanks. Thanks again. Um, now that you've mentioned the push out of September 24. When do you envisage the thousand hours being run off on two to three machines first before production? Well, test flying will start, uh, I can't remember the date without my slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what did I, uh, in that period, that, that, that six, yep. I think to get a thousand hours off a machine like that will, will take about a 12 month period. But remember, what we're doing in those flight test hours is you're initially going and doing a load, your envelope expansion, measuring the loads, and then all of the fatigue testing is done on a, an accelerated basis on test rigs back on the ground. So the lifing of the components, the things that will drive the integrity of the machine are done back on the ground. They're not tied to weather and operational limits. That's the key. So to get the experience on the systems and the components is relatively quick. It's a, a, a sort of six to 12 month period of round the clock running. Um, we will continue to fly off. I've always said we will maintain the fleet leader, and that's to shake out the niggly problems that you always get with new, new, prob uh, with new aircraft. And we'll fly those hours off as fast as we practically can within the, the constraints of daytime and, uh, and weather. And having the three prototypes will kind of multiply that as well. It is. Well, obviously, you've got a, it's more valuable to us to get as many hours as we can yeah. on, on uh, PP1. Yeah. Uh, and then the other two are the ones that we'll push out to go and see different and extreme environments, yeah. cope with cold weather, cope with hot weather, cope with humidity, and those signs. So those will be sent off on the travels uh, while PP1's flying in circles. <laughs> as we get ready for the next one on the audience, we have a uh, Simple. Make sure you put your hand up while he's reading this. Put your hand up. Simple, uh, but a little naughty one. A naughty one. So it says, uh, I've seen 160 knots on that simulator. <laughs> Can the HS50 achieve that speed? If you're very light and you're going downhill. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. The V&E is we're, what, we're, very, we're, very, uh, we're, we're very comfortable about the speed that we've declared for HX50. Um, there may be a nice surprise. That's it. That's <laughs> it for now. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Question from the audience. Over here right in the corner. Yeah, corner. Good afternoon. Thanks for the great presentation. Um, how are you managing the certification process, process in view of the fact that we're no longer members of EASA? <laughs> well, that, that in many respects is a, is a huge advantage to, to us. We're now dealing with a, a smaller authority that's much more uh, approachable, that's domestic to us. Um, the authority itself is obviously going through a, a period of recruiting and growth themselves. 
So they're, they're experiencing some challenges of their own right at the moment, but we couldn't have asked for any more support than we've been, been given. So uh, for us, the, the situation of, of coming out of, of, of Europe and having a, a local regulator has been a huge benefit. Great. Do you have ongoing support from the CAA as you yeah. you're going through? Yeah, we go, we're going through our organizational approvals at the moment. And again, we're balancing that with where we're at as an organization. Because with all of these things, you need to go in at the right point and it just be a tour de force of expertise on display. Uh, so you've got to choose the time to, to engage with the different levels of the process. Good. Another hand from the audience. And then in the meantime, um, will you be orchestrating or offering insurance for the HC50? So you want to yeah. just touch on that again? This is, this is one of the things I was going to mention in the, the presentation and then, then pulled it. Um, we've been doing work with various insurers around the, the, the world to just validate that insurance will be available. And we've been assured that insurance will be available. Um, but when we sat down and, and thought about it, all of the guys, are, the, the risk that you're insuring is essentially parts that have to come from me. And so I think the strategy that we're likely to take is to uh, form an insurance mutual that will provide global hull insurance for all HX and HC50s so that essentially we can get the effective hull value down to a level that brings the liability down and means that insurance will be much more cost effective for both the experimental and the commercial um, platform. So that's something that's very much work in progress at the moment. It's a... Uh, uh, in the very early stages because we've got our hands full. Um, but I think you can expect both the warranties and the insurance to be delivered directly through us. Excellent. We have a question right here. Yeah. yeah. Hi. I was wondering if the windshields are crash resistant. Yes, Great they question. are. So the, the windshields are designed to take a, uh, a two kilogram bird impact at... Uh, 200 knots. 200. Yeah, it's 200 that we designed to originally. Yeah. All right, and as we get ready for the next one, I have an online yeah, here, one. which I have a question first to the audience. Anybody here that is about six uh, feet tall? Tall person, okay. Yeah, we've got a few so we have, uh, we have a challenge here from somebody online <laughs> because they say that Misha is short. I don't think you're short. They, they, <laughs> they were saying I'm short. I, I took that a little bit, a bit offended, offended, right? But so okay. we have seen it's he's okay. short. I'm not sure if we, what, that seat uh, will handle a tall person. Could you please sit there in front yeah, yes. for the <laughs> online audience, please? Let's see how it feels. Is Eli here? He's, he's taller than that. Yeah. He's like seven feet. OK. There we go. <laughs> there you Very go. comfortable? Very All right. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. <laughs> yes, question over here. Hi, Jason. Hi there. I'm Svetlana. I'm from Canada. It's great to be here. I invested in your company last summer, and I was really impressed with you. So I'm a registered nurse, actually, and from a healthcare perspective, um, I'm just curious, if something happened to you uh, just out of a freak accident, are you confident that you have a team behind you that can carry on your legacy? Uh, By the way, that's a question that's also online. Question, yeah. so okay, you can so we have we, that double reinforced. <laughs> Very good. So we get, we've, we've been asked this question for a long time. Um, at, at the moment, the business is very dependent on me, uh, technically and uh, commercially. So for a little while longer, it's important that I survive. <laughs> um, however, we have an amazing team around us. And the more of these processes that we establish, the more of the, uh, the design and the, the, the infrastructure that we build, the more people re we recruit, the less important I get. <laughs> uh, and so it won't be too long before I don't matter anymore. <laughs> Thank you. You'll always matter. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Another question from the audience. Let's see a hand. And then in the meantime, um, will you be able to offer HX50 training here at Hill Helicopters? Yes. Um, and single engine turbine ratings? Yes, so we will. Ab initio training or just endorsement training? There's some technicalities we've got to formally work through with the, uh, the CAA on that. But yes, I'm convinced we will. OK. So because there's a lot of fun still to have tonight and uh, network together, we're just going to have like five minutes more for Q&A. Five minutes. So whatever you want to ask in five minutes, and we sh just uh, finish the presentation at 7 o'clock. Go ahead, Steve. I only get two questions. Yeah, um, Jason, a year and a half ago, I think you and I exchanged a note about uh, you were saying the potential using nano coatings on the blades. Uh, to um, address with icing. 
Are you still thinking about using uh, nano coatings? Uh, yes, everything is still on the table at awesome. the moment. OK, thanks. <laughs> Short and sweet. OK, another question. Yes, over here. Dino. Cheers. Uh, thanks, guys, for the presentation as well as the event. Awesome as usual. Uh, a couple of questions straightforward. Does the HX50 will have a LIMO and a U174 uh, connector for the headset? Uh, yes, it will be LIMO. Be a LIMO oh, on, only LIMO? Yeah. Uh, or as well as one. We have both plugs or just a LIMO plug? I think it's just intended to have LIMOs at the moment. There's no, there's no reason why it can't have the other ones. Yeah, there's some practical reasons why it might be helpful, but yeah. it's not necessary, I don't think. Yeah. OK. Yeah. It, it, yeah. it comes with the, the specification includes four, uh, five sets of Bose headsets. Yeah. So we, we'd equipped it with Lemos for that, for that reason. OK. Cool, thanks. Uh, next one is, uh, is it um, possible to integrate in a digital cockpit any um, point of no return formulas? as well as a critical point, so you always know how far you can fly. So can you give me that question again, uh, Dino? Sorry. I yeah, yeah. If you want to know what the point of no return is, is the digital cockpit, uh, can it show it to you, or do you need to know a uh, calculation as? For fuel so, Yeah, 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 I understand. So um, if you looked at the, the digital cockpit on the left-hand side of the display, it gives you your time uh, that you can remain in lo aloft, so your endurance, yeah. and it also gives you your range. So it will always give you the uh, amount of time and distance that you can fly. So that's calculated, and that's based on your current ground speed and your current fuel consumption. Perfect. So it gives you it, but you'd have to make, make a, a mental note of the impact of the wind if you were to change direction. Yeah, yeah. yeah I see. So okay. it, it gives you all of the information, and it, it gives you that information live. Yeah. But it doesn't know everything it needs to know about your intended route. OK, perfect. Last question, Would, will there be a, a carbon fiber interior? <laughs> <laughs> For you, do you know do you anything? Know? <laughs> <laughs> Anything's possible, right, Jason? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Right, right, thank you. Thank you. One last question. Last question. We have a last question here. On the upturned exhaust, I had a question in the rain. If you park in the rain overnight, do you have to put a cover over it to keep water from going in and also downwash for the rotors, does that have any effect on uh, air like blowing into the exhaust? Just a question, upturn versus like pointing back. OK, so in, in terms of uh, general care, uh, it's a good idea to keep helicopters out of the rain. Um, the, there's lots of precision uh, engineering. There's lots of very tight tolerances. There's lots of very important surface finishes. They need to be kept clean and dry, really. So. If you don't, uh, if you leave them outside, your machine will deteriorate faster than one that's that's looked after in a in a more conventional way. Um, and then, the, what was the question about downdraft? Is there any performance? Yeah, no, changes that's all, that's all taken into account. That's not a problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fantastic! And we right. passed 2,300 people watching live. Mm -hmm. Now the event has not ended. And it was a great presentation, great questions, all very, very nice. Thank you very much for this uh, part. And we shall move now to networking, get together again. Don't go anywhere. Thank you again, and thank you, Jason. And food. There's lots more food out in the marquee, so go ahead and enjoy some more food. Yeah.